Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's talk, Supply and Demand in the U.S. Firearms Industry, a Data-Based Exploration. My name is Chuck Anderton, and I'm a professor of economics here at Holy Cross. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's talk, the Reverend, Reverend Michael C. McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture, or CREC, as we call it, the W. Arthur Garrity Senior Professorship in Human Nature, Ethics, and Society, and the Department of Economics and Accounting. I would especially like to thank CREC Director Tom Landy, who is here, and his uh, excellent staff for their encouragement and support of this lecture. As you may know, CREC sponsors numerous programs that explore basic human questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. This afternoon's speaker is Dr. Jurgen Brower, Professor of Economics at Augusta University, Augusta, Georgia, and Visiting Professor of Economics at Chula Longkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. Dr. Brower earned his PhD in economics from the University of Notre Dame. He is a foremost scholar in the field of peace economics, having published about 100 art articles in scholarly journals and uh, academic books. And he's also uh, produced about a dozen books, including with Herbert Van Tull, the influential 2008 book, Castles, Battles, and Bombs, How Ec Economics Explains Military History, published by the University of Chicago Press. And earlier this year, a volume that he and I edited together, Economic Aspects of Genocides, Other Mass Atrocities and Their Prevention by Oxford University Press. Among his wide-ranging interests in the field of peace economics, Dr. Brower has published pioneering research on firearms industries of the United States and other countries, and he established an international research consortium on firearms and small arms data. I could go on and on about Jurgen's accomplishments, but I will add just two more points. First, Jurgen's wife Jennifer has been able to join us, and we're pleased she can be here. She's in the back. Thank you, Jennifer. And second, Jurgen is a good friend of mine, and I'm delighted that you'll have the opportunity to learn more about him. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jurgen Brower. Thank you very much, Chuck, and thank you very much to the College of the Holy Cross. My first time here, and it's a pleasure. It's a very nice venue. Uh, I appreciate that, too, uh, both for speaking and I hope for listening as well. It's uh, always good when you can kind of sink in uh, in, an, in a welcoming atmosphere. Um, right. Let me, uh, I was told that I have about 45 to 60 minutes of talk time, maybe 30 minutes or so of questions, comments, responses, some sort of interaction. Uh, we'll see how that goes. There's no clock at the back, and maybe from time to time I will look at my watch uh, or just uh, move uneasily, and I'll know it's time, time to stop. Uh, there's this old saying, professors can talk about anything, but you cannot talk about more than 50 minutes. So we'll, we'll see how, how that goes. Um, good. Um, the US firearms industry, specifically, uh, as the slide, uh, the title slide says, it's a data-based exploration. Sometimes I give talks uh, off the cuff. Sometimes I give talks that are scripted word by word. Sometimes it's a mixture of PowerPoint slides and off the cuff remarks and so on. But this particular presentation really is based on the slides because I want to share data with you. You need to see the data and so I have a lot of these slides. Uh, if I see that the time uh, comes to an end all too quickly, then I may skip a few slides. Um, I will talk specifically about quantities of firearms, number of units of firearms that we can track on the supply side of the market in the United States. And then I will also talk uh, more extensively about the firearms demand, where I believe I am, in fact, the first person in the country to come up, have come up with any sort of quantifiable, reasonably reliable data. There's a lot of speculation out there in the media in particular, which is used and misused and abused uh, by uh, various vested interests for cultural, political, uh, journalistic reasons. 
but here I give you data. And then uh, I hope I have some time to talk about the revenue that the industry generates, uh, exactly how large is this industry relative to the economy of the United States at large. And as economists know, and perhaps uh, everyone else can deduce, once you have quantity and revenue data, you can actually deduce average pricing data, and that certainly is absolutely new. Some of the data I show you have not been uh, published and shared uh, beforehand. So, which is why I put this note in here, uh, please no reproduction of any material presented in these slides without my explicit permission, because I want to be the first one to publish. All right. Um, I welcome, however, a lot of cooperative work. So if any one of you is a sociologist, psychologist, uh, economist, and you want to work with me using these data, uh, I would be very, very happy uh, to do so. I try to recruit as many other researchers as I can. All right. But primarily the talk is about data. Good. Um, by way of context, the small arms survey, which is a very respected uh, research organization in Geneva, has estimated that about three quarters of a million people die either directly or indirectly due to firearms. Uh, indirectly means that you may get injured, you know, you're shot somewhere in Kenya, for instance, uh, and you cannot make it to a clinic because the next clinic is three hours by dirt road away, and in the meantime you die. Uh, that's a large number of people, and of course in the development context it leads to economic development that is hindered. Uh, the opportunity for development is hindered uh, if, you, if you're injured, permanently injured, and you die. Uh, and so I came at it, at this whole topic, from a development perspective. Um, but for the United States specifically, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the P, oddly enough, is always left out of the abbreviation, and Atlanta um, reports that in the year 2013, the last year for which we have a complete set of data, we had about 2.6 million people die in the United States from all causes together, of which unintentional injuries or deaths from unintentional injuries were 130,000, and of those, 505 were due to an accidental discharge of a firearm. So somebody is cleaning a firearm, for instance, and accidentally hits the trigger, and a bullet is released and either hits that person or somebody else. Um, so that's clearly accidental. We also have intentional self-harm, suicides, about 41,000, more than half of which, 21,000, are due to firearms discharge. And we have, of course, intentional harm of other people, homicides, 16,000, about 11,000 of which due to a firearms discharge. So you add 21 and 11,000 together, and there's some other smaller categories, and you arrive at almost uh, 34,000 people in the year 2013 who died due to the discharge of a firearm. That's a fairly large absolute number. Okay. Now, the 34,000 translates into about 11 people per 100,000. I don't know what the population is of this town. What, what is it about? Worcester? Yeah? I'm not sure. Does anybody know population of Worcester? 300,000. So that would mean about 33 people in this area died in 2013 due to a firearms discharge, okay, just for perspective. This is broken down by uh, age groups. You see that from 1 to 4 and 5 to 14 children, not very much affected. And then perhaps surprisingly, 14, 15, 12, 12, 11, 11, 14, and about 14 for these various age groups. So 100 of 100,000 people who are 85 years or older, about 14 died due to the discharge of firearms. Many of them would be suicides. Uh, and that's fairly consistent across all the age groups, maybe a bit of a surprise. When you do it by male and female, of course, males and females are about 50-50 in the, in the population. Clearly, it's primarily a male problem, not a female problem. When you break it down white and black and various other racial categories, most of them white, but then we have more white people then we have black people as a percentage. And indeed, if you do it by 100,000 people, you see 18 per 100,000 for the African-American or black population, and then about 10 per 100,000 for the white population. That's just for context. Here's a final slide for context. Firearms deaths, 33 out of 2.6 million. But 
dying from a fall down the ladder, down the stairs, also over 30,000, and motor vehicle traffic also about 33, 34,000. So that's roughly where firearms deaths are located uh, in the overall grouping of all deaths that we have in the country. Now, all these numbers refer to deaths only, not to injury. That's important to keep in mind because when people begin to look at the cost of firearms-related deaths and injury, you can see that the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, estimates that the overall cost to the nation is about $670 billion, and the firearms-related part of that is about $57 billion in the cost due to firearms-related injuries and deaths. For example, emer emergency room visits in the hospital and so on. Now, the industry then says, well, what are the benefits? And they say, well, uh, the, the main industry association is the National Shooting Sports Foundation. That's the producer's association. That's not the consumer's association. The consumers have the National Rifle Association to speak for the consumers. But for the producers, we have the National Shooting Sports Foundation, the main industry association. And they say that the dollar value in 2015 uh, of economic benefits that the firearms and ammunition industry generates about 49 billion. So that's from the manufacturer, the importer, uh, the wholesalers, the retailers who employ people and so on. Now, so you do a cost-benefit analysis very crudely and you say, well, that's more or less even given that there are a lot of uncertainties involved in these sorts of numbers. And then people on the benefit side say, well, there's more than just a benefit from the supply of the firearms into the market. There's also a benefit from the actual usage of the firearm in the market. So, for instance, you have hunters who go out and go out and week hunting. So they need to drive to the hunting land. They need to pay for a license. Uh, they need to maybe book a motel uh, so that they stay out. They need to buy food. And all of these are economic benefits that the industry is generating. Uh, as a consequence of the shooting sport, the legitimate shooting sport. And so for 2011, the last time the industry did a survey on a calculation, they say it's $87 billion. Now that's clearly bigger than the cost. And then the anti-gun folks say, well, the medical cost is not the only cost. There are other costs having to do with the legal system, for instance, and insurance-related issues. So the Insurance Information Institute and industry body says, if you count the total societal cost of firearms-related injuries and deaths, that's $174 billion. And so it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And interestingly enough, and perhaps surprisingly enough, there is no one cost-benefit study ever done that I know of of that industry. And you would imagine that given the political and cultural discussion we have in this country about this particular industry, that somebody would have done a cost-benefit analysis, which is quite common in other uh, industries, uh, and the government very often conducts cost-benefits analysis, but we don't seem to have that for this industry. All right, that's the overall context. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about the politics and the culture. I want to talk about the industry as an industry. What do we know about the industry uh, in terms of data that then may help to uh, flow into the discussion about the, economic, about the political and cultural aspects? And I'll talk about demand and supply in particular. Let me skip a few slides right away and go to supply, show you some data. I hope you can see the slide from way back there. Uh, the data here is from 1980 onward all the way through 2015, the year that has just passed. The bottom line here in blue is the number of firearms imports into the United States from other countries. These are imports. Uh, of new and used weapons, of handguns, long guns, and so-called muscle loaders, a firearm that is loaded from the front. Very, very complex to obtain the data. The data are actually collected by Customs and Border Protection. Then they're passed on to the United States Census for processing, and then they're passed on for publication to the United States International Trade Commission. There are three different government agencies involved, and it took me a long time to kind of figure out who has which data and what do the data actually mean and what they don't mean. When the firearms are imported, you have to have a, a manifest, as it is called, 
The manifest does not distinguish between which firearms are new and which firearms are used. So we don't know whether, for instance, 90% of the imported firearms are new, or maybe only 80%, or maybe 99%. We do not know. By the same token, a muscle loader could either be a handgun that is loaded from the front, like an antique a replica weapon, for instance, or it could be a long gun that is loaded from the front, so that we actually don't know how many handguns and how many long guns there are because there's uncertainty about the muscle loaders. Okay. Yeah. Very good question. <laughs> Whether the import data include military weapons. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. There is, in fact, a category that is designated as a military firearm. And to this day, I have not been able to determine, after talking with the relevant bureaucrats, what exactly is a military firearm. Um, my current understanding is, and I believe it's accurate, is that a military firearm is not necessarily a firearm that is only used by military forces. It refers to certain technical specifications of the firearm, such as automatic fire. Um, so you can import an automatic firearm, uh, then you can disable the automatic mechanism, make it a semi-automatic, and then release it into the private commerce. Um, so the numbers I have include military weapons, um, because we cannot determine how many of them actually end up with the United States Official Armed Forces. Their number, however, is relatively small relative to the overall imports and probably does not distort the data picture. Then the brown line is weapons produced in the United States and domestically retained. Some of the weapons manufacturing that we do in the United States, of course, is exported. Exports actually are relatively small, but I count here only the domestically retained firearms. And then the green line is simply the addition of these two together. You can see in 1980, about 6 million firearms coming onto the market. The high point, 16 million firearms in the year 2013. And last year, about 12.6 million firearms that came onto the market. That's a very large absolute number. Okay. Um, what explains these movements? In fact, I have data back to 1946, but they're somewhat less reliable and credible, so I chose not to display them here today. What explains these up and down movements? Well, one argument might be that legislation and elections may have to do with the upswing and downswing of these data. Uh, so, for instance, in 1986, we have the Firearms Owners Protection Act uh, under the Reagan administration. People were concerned that if you have a firearm, you might be held legally liable for whatever happens with the firearm, even if it is abused by someone uh, in your household other than you, but you're the owner, and therefore you could be sued. And so this Firearms Owners Protection Act basically limits the uh, liability exposure to the owner, and you might argue that perhaps stimulated some of the demand. Okay. Um, then when Mr. Clinton was elected back in the early 1990s, People in the pro-firearms community were very concerned that this Democratic president might possibly introduce legislation at the federal level that would uh, curtail Second Amendment rights. And so in, in response to the election, there was a huge upsurge in the purchase of firearms, both imported and domestically produced. Then there was the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act. Um, and again, primarily election legislation related. Then in 1994, the assault weapons ban, and that's exactly when the overall, we see an overall decline in the number of weapons produced and released into commerce. Um, 1998, the Brady Long Gun Violence Act, uh, Prevention Act, however, doesn't seem to have, have to done much at all about the supply. Then Mr. Bush Jr., as I call him, was elected, George W. Bush. Um, and then the re-election in 2004, he takes office in 2005, and that's exactly the year when we see this huge upswing in the overall supply of weapons. And that's, of course, only a correlation. It's not necessarily causation. No one, to my knowledge, has yet done any statistical analysis trying to connect the descriptive data record with what may or may not be the underlying explanatory factors.
Mr. Obama was elected 2008, takes office in 2009. We see a huge increase here. Uh, again, when you read the news media, uh, in the gun industry itself, very much a fear effect. A Democrat will come into office, the Democrat will push federal legislation through Congress, and we will have some sort of restriction, therefore let us buy the arms now. Okay, very much so. Um, and then we have the re-election effect. Now for 2012, 2013, you might remember the Sandy Hooks Elementary School shooting. It's not the shooting itself that stimulated the demand, but it's as soon as the talk about restrictive legislation started that the demand went up. Okay. But there are other periods like this one where we have a decline in the overall supply. And those of you who are old enough, you might remember the early 1980s was a time of severe economic recession. People have less income. They have less disposable uh, income available for all kinds of purchases, including firearms. And indeed, in 1991, we had another recession and an overall decline in the supply. And again, in 2001, but not in 2008 and 2009. The decline came in 2010, maybe some sort of delayed effect. Okay. All I'm saying is that for, for the first time, we have a data record where statistical analysts, economists, political scientists, and so on, those who are quantitatively skilled, can now begin with my data to build explanatory models and try to tease out which of these factors might in fact have been relevant and therefore begin to use this for predictive purposes. There are other factors involved, import restrictions, uh, the mass shooting event in December 2012, or earlier this year in June 2016, the Orlando shooting in Florida, you might remember that, and those sorts of things. Whatever the underlying causal details are, for the year 2015, we have 12.6 uh, million firearms released into commerce, about 8.6 domestically produced and 4 million imported, very large number. If you add them all together over the 36 years I have, you come up with about 80 million, 80 million firearms imported, 170 million domestically produced and retained for a total of almost 250 million firearms. Now, you may have heard in the news media a number that says, roughly speaking, there's one firearm for every person in the United States. We have about 300 million people in the country. That would mean about 320 million weapons. And these data come from surveys that economists and sociologists and others do. And this is the first time that we can provide a rough equivalence with actual supply data and say, you know, this only goes back to 1980s. So if you go back to the 1970s and 60s and so on, then I would say it's not unreasonable that we come up to some total of 320 million firearms in this country, about one firearm per person. Okay? And that's, that's good to know that we don't have to rely on surveys alone, but we can have other quantitative data. All right, I'm repeating the same chart. And then you might argue, well, from 1980 to 2015, of course, we had population growth. And as the population grows, you expect that we have more firearms sales, so we need to adjust for population growth. And that would be per 100,000 people. And here's the chart. Oops, let me go back. That was too fast. Here's the chart. Um, very similar overall shape. This is per 100,000. So in the year 1980, about 2,500, 600 firearms per 100,000 people. In the year 2015, about 4,000 firearms per 100,000 people. Definitely an increase. Okay. Now, some people argue when you read the newspapers that in recent years we had an unprecedented increase in the number of firearms in the country. Unprecedented. I see this word very often in the news media. That's not entirely true. We had the same increase in the early 90s. And as I said, if you go back to the 1940s, we have seen this sort of increase before in the 1960s and 1970s. And I don't know if that's a hopeful sign. It's not unprecedented. We have gone through these periods before in this country, and presumably at some point the present upswell we have in the firearms per 100,000 may perhaps also decline at some point. Okay. Um, roughly, as a memory device, of every three firearms last year, two were domestically produced, 
one was imported. Yeah, I'll come to the I'll come to the point of used firearms in particular. Uh, we have no numbers on used firearms, but I will show you an estimation of what the the trade in used firearms is. We have a good idea of new automobiles and used automobiles. We really have no idea about used firearms. Uh, weapons that go off market altogether, nobody keeps track. Uh, all we know is that firearms are long-lasting capital items. You can put them in the ground, dig them up 50 years later, clean them, and they will work. Okay, and there's also a huge community of firearms collectors and so on, uh, antique weapons. Right. All right. Um, here, a word about the share of imports. So from 1980, uh, in 1980, about 10% of all weapons supplied to the markets were imported. And that import share increased to about 40% uh, up through the mid-2005 uh, or so. In other words, there was huge import competition. Just like any other industry, you would expect that there's, uh, there's a large market, right? And foreign manufacturers try to crowd into the market and provide import competition with high-quality weapons. Um, and correspondingly, that means that we had a decline in domestically produced firearms. In fact, the U.S. firearms industry was in economic crisis. Many companies went bankrupt. They changed ownerships many times over. There were foreign investors who bought, for instance, Smiths and Wesson. Um, and then it was, it was a, a British corporation that bought it, and then they sold it to a Brazilian corporation, and eventually was bought again by U.S. investors. Okay. But since 2005, again, we see this upswing in domestic production, a corresponding decline in the imported weapons. Yeah, I actually have data by country by month going back to 1989. Uh, and I was just about to make a comment on this because I'm from Berlin, Germany. And many Europeans look at the American uh, events and they say, what's wrong with these Americans? They just keep shooting each other. And then you read the news media and you look for which weapon was used in the homicide. And it's either an Austrian one or a German one or a Swiss one. Right? It's the, the Glock weapon and the Zig Zauer and so on. And actually, it's not so often the American makes that are used in homicide, but it's the European makes. So the Europeans often are a little bit smug uh, uh, about uh, this, the shooting that's going on in the United States. Uh, Austria, for instance, has since 1989, I just happen to remember that number because it was so striking, from 1989 through 2015. 10 million handguns from Austria into the United States. Okay, Germany about 7 million. Okay, so we can actually track it now for the first time, uh, and I have it on my computer right there, my laptop, country by country, month by month. Okay. All right, it still leaves the issue of the used uh, firearms recycling. I'll come back to that in a moment. So let me switch now to uh, demand. The demand side story is complex as well in terms of stitching the data together from various sources. The number one source is from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, I don't know if any one of you are firearms uh, users. Um, when you purchase a firearm in the United States, you go to a retail shop ordinarily, and you will be subject to a background check uh, of whether you have any history of felony or mental illness and so on. That background check is called, as you can see here, the National Instant Background Check System, or NICS. And these data are available on a monthly basis since November 1989, 1998. And I put them here in not a monthly form, but in a yearly form. And you can see there seems to be this huge increase in the number of people who actually go to a firearm store and say, I wish to purchase a firearm, and therefore I need to subject myself to this automated computerized background check. Um, and you can see the number here, this is about 22 million people whose background was checked as they walked into the store. And what the news media says, this is indicative of the demand for firearms, 22 million firearms demanded. Quick question. Just for firearms sales? Just for firearms sales, yeah, as opposed to... No, this is specifically for firearms, yeah. So when you go into a store, you ask for a handgun, a shotgun, whatever it may be, there will be a fire a background check. Question. Uh, 
not known. There, there are surveys out there, but again, survey data is somewhat unreliable. And you have numbers all over the place. We really don't know how big that market is. Yeah, and when I talk with firearms retailers, certainly that would be a fair assumption. Um, you will be able to buy some antique firearms in the firearms store, but most of those would probably be traded privately. But again, we don't quite know what the size of that market actually is. And it's a legitimate market, right? There's some history associated with it. I can't quibble. But what I do want to quibble about is these numbers that you see reported in the news media. These numbers, as I say, are released every month. And when you download the data from the FBI's website, it very specifically says on the data sheet um, that you cannot equate the number of background checks with the number of firearms sold. Nonetheless, the media says, oh, this is a good indication of the demand. And I will demonstrate to you that this is not a good indication of demand. All right, so the next background check does not equal demand. All right, so what I have done, I take the FBI's data and I adjust them to the numbers that probably reflect the actual demand rather than the number of background checks. And those are the blue numbers. And you can see back in 1999, the adjustment is just about equal to the actual number of background checks. But by the year 2015, instead of a supposed demand of 22 million, demand was probably only, quote unquote, for 15 million firearms. So a rising difference. Where does this difference come, come from? Well, here's the state of Kentucky. I have the data by month by state. All right? And what you notice for the state of Kentucky is this up and down movement from 1999 through to the middle of 2006. And what do you think this up and down movement during the year reflects? Hunting season, Hunting season exactly. There's a regular seasonality, as you would expect. And then all of a sudden, something happened with our good fellow citizens in Kentucky, and instead of about 20,000 weapons, they want to have 120,000. Well, that stretches credulity. So what happened? And then you see this number goes up and up and up, a huge decline, a huge increase, a huge decline, a huge increase, a huge decline, a huge increase. Maybe they drink too much bourbon in Kentucky, I don't know, or there must be some interpretation. And the interpretation is that what the state of Kentucky does every month, it conducts a background check of everyone who has received a concealed carry license, simply to check whether the person still is eligible to carry a weapon. It does not mean that the person went into the firearms store to buy a new weapon, it just meant means that the state of Kentucky checks whether the state is still, whether that person is still eligible. Kentucky does it on a monthly basis. Some other states do this on a quarterly basis. Some states don't do that at all. And so when I take these so-called permit checks and other categories out of the raw numbers, then I arrive at the adjusted numbers in blue, and they look like this. And all of a sudden we get the periodicity, the seasonality back into the data which then suggests that my adjustment is probably correct. It's still an estimate, it's still an approximation, but it certainly gets rid of this overestimation that the media is reporting. Now what happens when you do this on a cumulative basis rather than on a month by month basis, you get a picture like this. Cumulatively, it would appear as if our fellow citizens in Kentucky had a demand for firearms of 25 million. But my numbers suggest it's maybe only just under 5 million. So there's an overestimate that you see reported in the media by a factor of five. A huge misstatement. Okay. If you do this nationwide for all states, not just Kentucky, you get an overstatement of about 53 million firearms. So instead of 220 some million firearms demanded in the United States from 1999 to 2015, it is only about 170 million, right? It's still a very large number, let there be no misunderstanding. 170 million firearms is large, but it's not as large as the media would lead you to suspect. And to me, anyway, that's a bit of a problem, 
uh, I get many calls from journalists, liberal journalists, if you will, and uh, they report the, the line, the numbers of, the, the, of the, the background checks, and I think in the reporting, misreporting of these numbers, they actually stoke a bit of a hysteria in the population, that they, that they induce an amount of fear that's maybe not entirely justified. Um, so why not stick with the real numbers, large as they are? Okay. Um, per 100,000, um, that's the red line here. Back in 1999, <clears throat> um, on the right-hand side scale, about 3,500 firearms per 100,000 people, and that now has gone up to about 5,000 firearms per 100,000 people. Okay. So still a lot, but not quite as bad as the media would make it appear, okay? 4,462 last year per 100,000 people. All right, coming back to seasonality, hunting season. Uh, first time that anybody sees this graph. Uh, no one has seen it before. Uh, exactly as you would expect, the seasonality. A very, very, very distinct pattern. Uh, in the summer months, people do, do other things. And then by August, September, October, certainly we see this uptick. Uh, in the hunting demand, uh, Thanksgiving's usually one of the biggest sales day, days for firearms, and then Christmas. Uh, I talk to many firearms owners, and they're absolutely happy to buy a brand new so-called assault rifle for their one-year-old kid. I don't know why people do it, but they do it. It's, it's, it's what people do. All right, and then in uh, January, we have a fall-off. Uh, after the Christmas season, a bit of an upswing in February, March, and then the decline into the summer months. And you can see from the pattern, it's a very regular pattern with some exceptions. December 2012, the Sandy Hooks Elementary shooting, uh, school shooting, um, which carried over into January 2013. That was also the Obama election, uh, the re-election. And then in 2015, in December, you might remember, almost a year ago, Mr. Obama going on national TV and shedding tears about yet another funeral, mass funeral, that he has to attend on account of a mass shooting. And that these tears evoked a big emotional response, not just for the anti-gun folks, but also for the pro-gun folks. And the pro-gun folks said, oh, legislation is coming, legislation is coming, legislation is coming, let's buy the guns now. Okay? So that's, I think, pretty straightforward. Now, again, I said I have the numbers by state by month, so let's look at the state of Mississippi. There's Mississippi, the same seasonality pattern, but I want to focus on September 2014 and 15 in particular. And you can see, perhaps from the slide, that most of the time, from August to September, nothing much is happening. Pretty much the same amount of firearms demand, maybe even a little bit of a decline. But in 2014 and 15, we see an increase in the firearms demand from August to September. What happened? Well, what happened is that the state of Mississippi introduced what they call the Second Amendment tax sales holiday. In other words, you can go firearm, not pay any sales tax. Well, if I'm a firearms owner, Instead of buying the gun in October, I might as well buy it in September and purchase a firearm. Okay? And that clearly accounts for this increase in September 2014 and 15. Now, Louisiana did the same thing starting in September 2009. And again, we see basically the same effect. And then a, a drop off in October. So basically, it's a substitution effect. This Second Amendment uh, sales tax holiday was actually started in my own state. I live in Georgia and in South Carolina. It was started in South Carolina in 2008, in November. South Carolina, uh, however, abolished the sales tax holiday for firearms after the 2010 season because they recognized that the substitution effect was going on. People on the whole don't buy any more firearms and just buy it in a different month. And you can actually go and Google State of South Carolina Department of Revenue and you find documentation from the budget analyst, the official government budget analyst saying, well, essentially we're losing tax dollars uh, and that's not good for the state of South Carolina, so we abandon 
this experiment, but then, as I said, Louisiana and Mississippi picked up on it, and other states have introduced but not passed legislation to a similar effect. So it's good that we have these very fine-grained, month-by-month, state-by-state data for potential analytical purposes. Here's the state of Florida. The Orlando shooting, June 12, 2016. You see this periodicity. Uh, you see that's definitely an upward trend over time. You see a couple of spikes. Where is June 2016? Very hard to see. Right? You see here at the end there's a bit of a spike, but it almost looks like the Thanksgiving's Christmas season spikes. It's very hard to see. So what happens if you transform the data into a different type of measurement, uh, like this one? If instead of looking at the absolute number of firearms sold, you look at the percentage that the state of Florida is responsible for out of the nation as a whole, and then you see a very distinct spike in June 2016. This is actually due to uh, work at the New York Times, the data editor at the New York Times. They had called me, they wanted to have my, uh, an explanation of how I adjust the data, and I gave it to them. And then they honored me with a page one homepage New York Times uh, feature, but they introduced this additional wrinkle, which I thought was very interesting, very clever of them, because it allows you to highlight a state as a percentage of overall demand in the United States, and therefore it picks up these spikes in a much better way. Um, here's another example, much more striking, Maryland. Um, usually 1% of firearms sales in the United States are taking place in the, in the state of Maryland, and all of a sudden, in the middle of 2013, a huge spike, 5% of all firearms, a quintupling. So immediately you ask yourself, what happened that month? Well, here's the story. In April 2013, we had legislation proposed in the state legislature of Maryland to ban certain types of weapons, assault weapons, from sale in the state. That was passed a month later. The legislation was signed in May, and then it was supposed to take effect October the 1st, 2013, and it is in the months before September 2013, that we get this huge spike. Let's buy those weapons right now, because on October the 1st, they will be banned, and then things went back to normal, okay? So we can pick this up very, very clearly now, and that might be very interesting for analytical studies in the future. And you can't do that unless you have those data, which is why I'm saying I'm very happy to cooperate with anyone who wants to do the analytical studies rather than just the descriptive data. All right. Um, Talking about analytics, uh, earlier this year I published uh, a paper in the Journal of Economic Geography with Daniel Montolio uh, from Spain and Elisa Trujillo, who is originally from Venezuela. And we actually looked at the location of firearms manufacturers across the 50 states. We had 25 years of data. We have actually all the data by street address for each firearms manufacturer in the United States, about 3,000 of them. And we also put together a data set, 50 states, 25 years, and year to year for each state, we looked at changes in firearms legislation to see whether the change in state firearms legislation would have any impact on the location decision of a firearms manufacturer. And the reason we did that is because many firearms manufacturers threaten their home state. They threaten the legislature of their home state, and they say, if you pass le restrictive legislation, then we will pack our bags and we will move to Nevada, for instance, or South Carolina or some other state. And so we wanted to see what's the credibility of that threat. And it turns out, indeed, that states with relatively lax firearms legislation attract more firearms manufacturers. But in addition to that, there's also very clear economic reasons uh, of why manufacturers move from one state to another. So the threat, to some degree, is a little bit empty. Right. Um, all right. What do you think is the most gun nut, quote unquote, state in the nation? Any guess? Where are the most gung ho gun nuts? Uh, New Hampshire, or Texas. or Texas? Okay. Other suggestion? Nevada. Nevada? Alaska. Alaska. All right. Well, here's your answer. It's not Maryland. All right, 
The red line is the average for the United States. The blue line is for the state of Maryland. But you do see the spike again in 2013. Well, what about Texas? Texas, perhaps surprisingly, is just about average. Texas is large. Therefore, they have a large number of firearm sales, as you might expect. But if you do it per 100,000 people, it's just an average state. Okay. So here are the top 10 in red and the bottom 10 in black. And just read the states, the top 10, Alaska. One of you had Alaska. Okay. South Dakota, West Virginia, Montana, Alabama, Wyoming, North Dakota, Colorado, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. What strikes you about the set of states? Okay, what else? Less densely populated. Less densely populated? Yeah. What else? Midwest and far west, right? Even Alaska. What else? Lots of rural population, and in particular, lots of hunting land. Many of them, not all of them, but very many. So it really makes sense. It makes intuitive sense. The data show what you really would expect when you begin to think about firearms demand in the United States. And on the other hand, Hawaii, very restrictive. Um, then Washington, D.C., New Jersey, Iowa, Nebraska, New York, Massachusetts, our fair state, I understand is your slogan. Uh, New York, Massachusetts, North Carolina, perhaps surprisingly, and then Rhode Island and California. All right, so quite a bit of variation. It's very nice to be able to pick this up month by month, state by state, and perhaps even for regional scholars to investigate particular regions. And it's the first time that we have these data, and therefore that we potentially conduct analytical studies. Do you have data on the geographical distribution of the Yes, we do. Uh, we do have data. Every month you can download um, data from the U.S. government on the number of retailers and their street addresses. Okay. Uh, I've done it not on the retail end. I've done it uh, for the actual manufacturers. And I see the distribution and how the distribution changes over time. Um, we used to have something back in the 1700s. We called it the Connecticut Valley along the Connecticut River, where most of the firearms manufacturers were located, in part because that's where the population was, in part because you needed water to drive water wheels for machinery. And then as we built canals, the manufacturers located along the Erie Canal, for instance, because you needed, again, water for transportation. And then we had uh, road networks and interstate networks and so on. You can see how there's a correspondence between the location and the infrastructure of the country. So it's very interesting studies you can do from economic history as well. But yeah, we have data for retailers. Okay. Hawaii is a uh, very restrictive firearms legislation, essentially. Uh, in Guam, which is a U.S. possession, they introduced a tax, $1,000 per weapon, uh, this year. And small as the firearms demand is in the territory or possession of Guam, uh, I can actually sh measure uh, the, the impact of that $1,000 tax per firearm. The question back there. Yeah. Again, this is adjusted per 100,000 people, but California, in, in fact, uh, is trying very hard to to limit um, the possession of weapons. And there's there's big political and legislative battles going on, absolutely. A big state with many weapons, but per, per 100,000, not so very different. In fact, below average, about half of the average, right? Um, what we can also do now is forecast demand. We were never able to do that before. Um, yeah, I, I developed a so-called technical forecasting model where the numbers themselves, sort of like in the financial markets, the numbers themselves produce a forecast. There's no explanatory model behind it. Um, and you can see the uh, blue line here is the actual numbers on a quality basis, and then the red line are the forecasts or the backcasts. This vertical line here is for the third quarter of 2016, which just finished at the end of September. And I was forecasting the sale of about three and a half million firearms, something that has never done 
uh, before and might be of potential interest for the industry itself, of course. It might be for the pro-gun groups, the anti-gun groups. It might also be of interest for uh, the medical community and, of course, the uh, police forces, the law enforcement uh, folks, especially since we can do it now on a per-state basis. Um, unhappily, my forecast for the quarter that just ended turned out to be wrong. And I'm quite happy to admit this. Uh, here you can see um, my forecast was for 3.5 million. The actual number as it came in was for 3.8 million, probably because of the summer of shootings that we had this year, either police shooting people or people shooting the police. You might remember that. And that stokes, again, all kinds of fears and therefore drives up the demand. And since my model is a technical model without any explanatory variables, uh, I missed it by about uh, 300,000 weapons. But still, in terms of the overall picture, I think even this technical forecast gets pretty close, and it's better than nothing. So for the quarter that we are in right now, I predict over 5 million weapons will be sold. And early in January, you can invite me back, and I can tell you whether or not I was right. Uh, we'll see. Okay. Now I come to the issue of used firearms. Um, for 2015, um, I know from the background data that we had 15, about 15 million firearms sold. Um, I know from the uh, ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, that the supply of new firearms in the United States, every manufacturer is annually required to report how many weapons they sold to the ATF, uh, simply for tracking purposes in case there's a firearm that's used in crime. And so we know that was about 8.6 million. We also know that the import data were about 4 million, so that leaves a remainder of about 2.5 million firearms that must have been recycled. Because when you do go to a firearm store, uh, you can buy a new weapon or a used weapon. In fact, the firearms retailers, I talked with some of them, they prefer to sell used firearms. And the reason is that the profit margin is much higher on a used firearm than on a new firearm. Okay. Um, so when you do this not just for one year, but for several years, uh, I have this somewhere here in the bottom slide, you can see that the number of, let me see, where do I have it? Uh, used firearms, I think it's this one here. The number of domestic used firearms purchased probably declined since the year 2000, and therefore the number of you, you, uh, new firearms increased. Now, these are estimates. And in fact, you can see at one point the number of used firearms is negative, which cannot be, all right? Uh, so there must be some error in my estimation method. But I think, uh, again, that I'm the first one to try in, in, in kind of a backward, roundabout, uh, back of the envelope way to try to figure out what is the size of the used firearms market. When I talk with retailers, I get very, very different numbers. Even the industry does not seem to have any idea of what the size of that market is. Perhaps because some firearms are sold by Walmart and Kmart, big box retailers. Other firearms are sold by specialty stores. Other firearms are sold by pawn brokers. Uh, other firearms are sold by hunting specialists and so on. So when you talk with different retailers, you get very different numbers of how many used firearms they're selling. But this first time you have any indication of what that percentage may or may not be. All right, very quickly. Um, let me go to revenue. I mentioned a $6 billion number before, I believe. This is out of a $16,000 billion economy, $16 trillion economy. Um, the industry also then says $49 billion or $87 million. You might remember those numbers from before. But at $6 billion, $49 billion, $87 billion, out of $16 trillion, it's vanishingly small. The industry has a huge political and cultural impact in the United States. It has an exceedingly small impact, economically speaking. Of course, they do employ people. There are so many jobs uh, involved in this industry. But from an economy-wide perspective, we probably could totally dispense with the industry and hard, we would hardly be able to measure it in terms of the overall economic activity in the United States. Um, for comparison, pet food sales, about 24 billion. All right, just, I threw that in there for just to have a different anchor and a different marker there. Um, all right, 
industry revenue comes, uh, it's uh, in various ways estimated. Um, a manufacturer of firearms is obligated to pay an excise tax, 10% on handguns. So when, a, when if I'm a firearms manufacturer and you're a wholesaler, at the time that I release the firearm to you as a wholesaler into commerce, at that point, I'm as a manufacturer, I'm obligated to pay a 10% tax on the handgun, an 11% tax on the long gun, 11% tax also on ammunition. Okay. Um, there are huge data problems. I don't have time to get into that. But one example for last year, calendar year 2015. You see the number of handguns, 4.3, domestically produced, 2.4, imported. That's a total of 6.7. The amount of taxes collected is 10% tax, about 200 million, and therefore by implication it must have been a $2 billion sales from the manufacturing level and import level to the wholesale and report, retail level. From that you can conclude that the average wholesale price of a handgun about $300 per unit. First time you have those sorts of data. For long guns, you can do similar calculations, average price about $312 per unit, ammunition about $2.2 billion. Okay, if you do this for all years, uh, overall sales revenue $6 billion. If you do this for all years, let me skip this one. Um, uh, where do I have this? Maybe I forgot this slide. But anyway, let's focus on the prices then. Um, I do this for all the years for which I have data. The blue line is the average long gun price adjusted for inflation. The red line is the average handgun prices adjusted for inflation. And you can see uh, that the average price for handguns between $200 and $300 at the manufacturer level to the wholesaler. The retailers, of course, have their markup eventually. Okay. Average long gun price a little bit more, 225 to about 325. Now, how do I know, since these are inferred prices, how do I know that they're more or less reasonable. And one answer is that we actually have one manufacturer, Ruger, very prominent manufacturer, which is a publicly traded stock company on the New York Stock Exchange. And that company is therefore obligated on a quarterly basis to release information to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And in those public documents, they report how much they sell in dollar values, and since I have the quantity numbers, I'm able to figure out the actual average wholesale prices that Ruger charges to the wholesalers. Okay, and here are their numbers. Average handgun price, 250 to 350, and average long gun or rifle price, 230 to 290, which is not so far off from the imputed numbers that I have for all the manufacturers together. In addition, I also have proprietary data from the National Shooting Sports Foundation that I cannot share with you. What I can share is uh, sort of a summary picture. They did retail surveys from 2007 to 2011, and handguns at the retail level with the markup sell for about $200 to $500, and the rifles for $200 to $400. And so again, I know that my imputed numbers are pretty much on target. Okay, And I think that's just about the last slide here to conclude. Why did I get involved into this, in the study of the U.S. firearms industry? Perhaps surprisingly, it is not my interest in the politics and culture of the firearm in the United States. Rather, it is my interest as a development economist, because I lived in Africa and I have seen the damage that firearms can do. And so I wanted to collect data on that industry, but as so often, the only industry in the country, in the world, where you can actually data from is very often in the United States. When you go to Germany, you don't get firearms data. When you go to Austria, you don't get firearms data. When you go to Kenya, South Africa, Brazil, Pakistan, you don't get firearms data. So to learn anything about the industry at all, you come here. And you, you, at least you begin to have the, the, the uh, commencement of data collection and analytical studies of what is this industry? How many are there? What, 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 what are their costs? What, who, who are their customers? Uh, what do they actually produce, etc.? And I hope that these sorts of studies eventually will carry over into some uh, other countries. Uh, I think I have to somewhere here. South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, Brazil, Pakistan, all of them are beginning to produce commercial military-grade firearms. And since it's a relatively simple technology that's involved, you kind of 
suspect that there will be technology transfer taking place. And therefore, the more we learn about this industry here, maybe by implication and by analogy, we also learn about what this industry may or may not do in those countries where there may be even less, fewer restrictions than we have in the United States. All right, I think that was the last one. So I used my hour uh, now, and I was very happy that you had a lot of questions and interrupted me. But let's have a bit of a discussion um, and questions, comments, observations. Yeah, and I, I think Paul is already uh, rectifying my mistake here. Um, Yeah, let's see here. All right. 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 And at this point, yeah, you're right. I should have been more careful in the wording. There's no uh, evidence that I'm aware of at the moment. Mexico, some of my friends at uh, University of San Diego uh, have begun to, to conduct analytical studies. Um, at the retail level, somebody was asking about the number of retailers in the United States. Uh, analytical studies um, suggesting that a large number of violent crime-related deaths in Mexico are conducted due to weaponry that is exported illicitly or illicitly from the United States to Mexico. So there we have actual data uh, and inferential studies, statistical studies, that make a pretty credible case um, and to some degree also in Central America. For many other countries, uh, I have for, for many years I've asked my friends at the Small Arms Survey and elsewhere uh, asking if they have a database of the actual model of weapons that are used uh, in the perpetration of mass atrocities, for instance, a topic that Chuck and I have studied recently. And I seem to be unable to get a database of the actual weapons. The AK-47, or variants thereof, the AK-74, et cetera, is a very, very prominent uh, weapon that's used in many civil wars in Africa. It's even on the flag of some countries. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that all firearms deaths in those countries are due to the AK-47 alone. It would be very nice to actually be able to trace the particular model and see which countries ultimately are responsible for shipping these weapons over there. Or, very often we have illicit supply chains, of course. Um, but I know of no direct evidence at this point. But perhaps studies like these are really digging deep into the data. I think I was emailing Chuck the other day saying, this is the sort of data for which a young assistant professor will never earn tenure. Um, because it took me literally about 10 years to piece together the various items of information and interview government officials and, and try to extract it from, from them, often they would actually laugh at me. You want data about military weapons imported into the United States? Ha, ha, ha. I've been a bureaucrat for 30 years. I can tell you the numbers are worth nothing. And those sorts of situations I have faced many, many times. Uh, but persistence, especially when you're tenured, uh, I hope will pay off uh, so that once these sort of data are published and, and people have an opportunity to conduct analytical studies, that then uh, gradually our knowledge base will increase. Yeah. Other questions, comments, observations? Uh, I think you're asking about causality. Is it the media coverage that causes the demand, or is it the event that covers that causes the demand spike? Is that what you're asking? No. Uh, okay. I've never done a formal study. I'm not sh off the top of my head. I'm not aware that anybody has done a formal study of media coverage and spikes in demand. Uh, casually, I would say absolutely. Um, but again, it's, it's not so much the event of a shooting in the United States, it's when the discussion starts, should we have more restrictive legislation at the federal or the state level? That then we get the spike. It's not the event, it's the, the fear of restriction that causes the demand spike, and then it goes back down to normal. Yeah. But I hope that at some point we will be able to put together a database. I know there are databases on mass shooting events. There are various definitions of what exactly is a mass shooting. Um, and then correlate this month by month, state by state, and see if we statistically can actually pick up the correlation and say you know, of the, whether or not there is a causation 
to the event or causation to the discussion of the feared threat of legislative intervention? David? Absolutely. Some folks in the, um, well, I say absolutely. No, absolutely no, because we don't have statistics studies yet. But some folks of the so-called anti-gun folks um, have suggested that the real battle over so-called gun control is actually not at the federal level. The real battle is being fought at the state level, and that the federal institutions follow after the states have sorted out their thing. Uh, somebody mentioned California earlier. California is getting more and more restrictive uh, uh, in the face of resistance, of course, from the firearms industry. Um, and there are various experiments in different states of how restrictive or non-restrictive to be. Um, and there is, in fact, a, a fair amount of legislative activity at the state level in what you might call in favor of the anti-folks rather than in favor of the pro-folks. And maybe 10 years down the road that will percolate up to the federal level. Um, and I, I tend to agree just from what I read that the, the current critical discussion is really at the state level rather than federal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that addresses your question entirely, but. Well, my question went more to measurement. So yeah. you measure after events in Colorado, what Right. No, again, where we are at the moment, I hope, is that I'm the person who generates the data. And by beginning to make the data public, we can then not only ask, but perhaps ultimately answer those sorts of questions. That's why I pointed to the one study I published earlier this year about changes in legislation state by state, 50 states over 25 years, and correlate that or causally to location decisions. But you could also do that correlation in regard not to location decisions, but to some other factors. Uh, such as legislation or shootings. So I hope those sorts of studies will come out over time. But for that, of course, you need the data. And ultimately, the hope is, uh, apart from my interest in developing countries, my hope is that in the United States, we will be able to better inform the discussion in this country so that we don't just stay stuck at the political cultural level in the absence of data, that, but we can make some sort of data contribution and maybe it will become a somewhat more reasoned discussion. Well, that may be a false hope, but we'll see. <laughs> I, I remove so-called so permit checks and various other categories. Once if you pawn a firearm and then you go back and purchase the firearm back, uh, it, um, that's not a new firearms demand. You just get your own firearm back. So that needs to be removed from the data source. Uh, the National Shooting Sports Foundation does a similar adjustment. Uh, the difference between their adjusted number and my adjusted number is about five percentage points. Uh, I think my numbers are a little bit more accurate. Um, I can also do it state by state. Right. Yeah. This is this is brand new data, basically. Uh, so, I, I, well, depending on my time availability, I hope that that a lot of it eventually will get into the public realm, um, and then share the data for research purposes. Right. So if any of you are interested, uh, or any of your students perhaps that you could get interested, I'd be happy to make data available. And I adjust for that. I actually interviewed a number of retailers uh, and manufacturers and so on. Uh, and even the National Shooting Sports Foundation, when they do retail surveys, they say for every person who comes into the store for which you do a background check, how many guns do they end up buying? And it turns out uh, and that corresponds to my own interviews with retailers, um, that it's about 1.1 weapons purchased per person for whom there's a firearms check. And my adjusted numbers account for that. The industry's adjusted numbers do not. So I think that my number's actually a little bit more accurate. I believe the law says that every time you go to a store, you will be checked. So it would be counted as four times. And why would you go to the store four times a year unless you actually intend to purchase a firearm? It's just a complication. Uh, it could well be that you know, I could go to a store and be checked and then decide not to buy the firearms after all. But it's a point of sale check. So you're basically ready to pull out your credit card or your cash, and it's a, sort of a three-minute check. You fill in the form, it goes to the computer, and then 
way more than 90% of the cases get an immediate response from the FBI's computer, and the retailer gets a control number, puts it in the form, and says, yes, this person is permitted to purchase the firearm. Yeah. So that would be four, at least, or four or 4.4 firearms in my adjustment, right? The number of rejections, I can't quite remember off the top of my head, they're not extraordinarily large. If I'm a convicted felon, I know better than to go to a firearms retailer and have me checked, because I know that the firearms could not be re uh, released to me. Um, so that would probably more a, a private uh, party sale, a garage sale, uh, or even an illicit sale. Um, <clears throat> another issue is what about internet sales? Uh, Gunbroker.com, uh, a big site. Um, you can purchase the firearm via the internet, but then if it is shipped, let's say, from Arkansas to Georgia, I would take receipt of the firearm through a locally based firearms retailer, and therefore I would be checked at that point. Thank you, everybody. Let's give uh, your guys.